Hi, I'm Gidon from TechnologyMan.com. Stride is a wearable running gadget that clips onto the shoelaces of one of your running shoes and measures your running power as well as a number of other metrics. The data is all fed in real time to your running watch or in my case Apple Watch. Typically runners measure their effort by feel, heart rate or more commonly by pace from their running watch. You might try and run a 5k race at a 7 minute mile say and you'd use your watch to check your paces on track. But what happens when you're going uphill or downhill or the terrain changes and you're running through mud or over moorland? This is where the Stride footpod comes in. Stride generates a power number in watts that you aim to try and keep roughly constant, so you don't go too hard uphill or too easy downhill for example. But it does a lot more than this, including measuring your running form as well as distance and pace much more accurately than is possible using GPS. So let's take a closer look. Stride comes nicely packaged and the first thing you notice is just how small and light it is. It measures 4cm by 3cm at its longest and widest points and weighs just under 10 grams including the shoe clip. It feels well constructed, enhanced with carbon fiber according to Stride. It's water resistant rather than waterproof with an IP67 rating. So fine for splashing through puddles but not recommended for river crossings. In the box you get the Stride pod itself, a wired charging cradle attached with a standard micro USB cable and two shoe clips, one black and one orange. It's not well advertised but it also supports Kai wireless charging and charge fine on the cheap bedside wireless charger I use for my iPhone 10. There should be enough charge to go for a run straight off, but a 30 minute charge is meant to be enough for an easy run and 3 hours provides a full charge. The pod clips into the wired charger hinging in from its rear wider side. The orange light glows whilst charging and turns off when fully charged. The battery life is meant to be 1 month, but that will depend on how much you use it. But I have found the battery life to be good. I've been using it a good few hours a week for running, but I've also had it on for walks. I'm charging it every couple of weeks to be safe and it's generally lost far less than half its charge. There are no instructions in the box, but there is a card directing you to support.stride.com which gives clear instructions on setup. The basic procedure is to download the Stride app on Android or iOS, create an account with Stride and pair the device by placing it next to the phone. It's important at this point to check you have the latest firmware by tapping settings, software update on iOS at least. Mine was already up to date, but if you do update the firmware on iOS, Stride recommend resetting Bluetooth. Next you'll need to configure the Stride app with your unit preference and weight and height. On iOS, Stride can read your current weight and height from the Health app, if you give it permission, and you have those measurements set. Attaching Stride to your shoe is straightforward. The clip slides under your laces, and you hinge the wide rear of the pod into the back of the clip, and then firmly press the front to hear a satisfying and loud click. It's worth double checking this is nice and secure. To remove the pod, you push down on the front of the clip, not the Stride. You can use Stride with just a smartphone app, in fact you don't even need to take your phone with you. Stride will record your run internally with its inbuilt storage and can be synced via the app when you get back with what Stride called an offline sync. And the experience is of course much better with a watch and Stride support a huge range of smartwatches from Garmin, Suunto, Polar, Samsung and Apple and support a connection via both Ant Plus and Bluetooth. You will need to check that your specific model is supported. I'm mainly using Stride with an Apple Watch Series 4 and the watch app is very comprehensive. The app should automatically be installed on the watch when you install the iOS app. If not, go to the watch app, scroll down to available apps and install the Stride app. Stride offer detailed instructions for getting set up on other watches on their support site and I'll cover setting up with a much cheaper Garmin watch shortly. If you run regularly, it's worth setting up a shortcut to the Stride app using a watch face complication. For an outdoor run, check GPS path is enabled. Stride will get pace and distance from Stride without any need for calibration and it's far more accurate than using GPS. It will use the phone or watch's GPS if you don't have your phone with you to display the route you followed when you upload the run. It will also use the Apple Watch's obstacle heart rate monitor. Most of the other settings are fairly obvious and there's a convenient help mode that will describe each option clearly. I turn off auto start so I can confirm GPS lock, I turn auto pause off for most of the time and usually have auto lap set to every mile. You need to check your settings for units here match those in the profile settings on the app. There's an option to configure what pressing the two side buttons do, either the default pause resume run or to trigger a lap. You can also adjust your target power, but when you start off you'll have no idea what this is, so you can just leave it at its default value. Finally you get to the fun bit where you can set up up to three run screens that you can swipe between with your finger or scroll through with the crown. Each screen can have up to seven metrics displayed. And depending on the metric, you can adjust the averaging to display real-time, 3-second averaging, 10-second averaging, lap average or overall average. 
It's hugely customizable and very clear, especially on the larger screen of the latest Series 4 44mm watch. There is an alternative app you can use with an Apple Watch or on your phone itself if you don't have a watch. iSmoothRun has some more advanced options. For example, you can create workouts and set a calibration factor for your stride if you feel it's off. They've just added a beta workout mode to the Stride app, so it'll be interesting to see how this develops. Although the main selling point of Stride is running power, it measures a number of other metrics too. If you're a data junkie like me, it's heaven. Stride has a 9-axis motion sensor that tracks your foot through three-dimensional space, recording accelerations, impacts and forces that are being applied. It then uses proprietary algorithms to calculate the various metrics. The main metric is of course power. I'm very familiar with power meters on bikes having used them in various guises for a few years. Bike power meters use a strain gauge to directly measure power from the force applied through the pedals multiplied by your pedaling cadence. Power meters on bikes from numerous vendors will agree within a few percent. Measuring running power is more complex and there doesn't appear to be much agreement between the various running power meters available. Stride validate their data in a variety of ways including using a special force plate treadmill that directly measures the forces applied. At this time, the absolute power value is not so important as consistency and I have found Stride very consistent. I'll cover this in more detail shortly. Next up, Stride measures pace and distance and it does it more accurately than GPS without any need for calibration. I was quite skeptical about this but have been impressed, especially with regard to pace which reacts very quickly. It also means you'll get distance and pace when you couldn't otherwise, either outdoors without a clear view of the sky or indoors on the treadmill where it's also well supported by Zwift for indoor running as a simple running pod. I confirmed the accuracy of Stride against an 800 meter measurement off Google Maps using the measure distance function which I found to be very accurate. Stride without any calibration gave a measurement of 800.52 meters. GPS using a Garmin 4 on a 230 gave 805.25 meters, which is only a small amount off, but this was in a completely open space in a straight line with a clear view of the sky. So about the best result GPS can provide. Stride also measures cadence, which is considered an important running metric by many. And you can configure this in RPM, revolutions per minute, or SPM, strides per minute, which will just be twice RPM, depending on your preference. It should be more accurate measuring cadence in the foot pod than using the built-in measurement from your watch's accelerometer. The other metrics recorded are more advanced, but I'll cover them briefly. GCT or ground contact time measures how long your foot touches the ground for each stride. VO or vertical oscillation measures how much you move up and down. And LSS or leg spring stiffness models your leg as a spring to measure how well you recycle the energy applied to the ground. Finally, there's form power, which is another measure of running efficiency basically wasted vertical motion that's not moving you forward. These aren't metrics you need to be too concerned with whilst you're running but are useful to track over time or over a long run to gauge running form and fatigue. In simple terms you want GCT and VO to reduce and your LSS to increase over time and you want form power to decrease at similar running speeds. All these metrics except form power can be viewed live using the three run screens on the Apple Watch but I found them more interesting to review afterwards on Stride's power center analysis platform where you can also see the form power. At the moment, Strava only pulls cadence across, but these other metrics aren't discarded, so it's possible they'll be available for analysis at a later date. The browser extension Stravistics, or recently renamed Elevate, can show running power at least. There are a few metrics missing, some which could be added quite easily via a software update, I imagine. For example, there's no vertical ratio, which is VO divided by stride length, which provides an easier metric for understanding efficient running, or smoothness that Wahoo's ticker X heart rate strap calculates based on the rate of change of acceleration or jerk. Again, possibly useful for improving running form. There's also no consideration of local wind conditions that Garmin's running dynamics measures, although I'm not sure how accurate or reliable this would be since it's based on pulling the current weather from the internet. Still, there's plenty of metrics that you can pour over and I'm sure more will be added over time. I only got into running relatively recently as a convenient form of exercise when I don't have my bike, but I have found it quite addictive. I started off with a Wahoo Ticker X heart rate strap, which I already use for cycling. This also measures a number of quite useful running metrics, although not power. But there's no watch app, and the metrics are only available on its smartphone app with no synchronization to any platform, so not really an awful lot of use, which is a shame. The Apple Watch is already quite a decent running watch, even just using the built-in workout app. You can get pace, cadence, and heart rate, and the latest Watch OS 5 also offers rolling pace and pace alerts. But partner with Stride, with its multiple highly configurable run screens and metrics galore, it takes the whole experience up a notch. It couldn't be easier to use. Open Stride either tapping the complication from your watch face or from the dock and tap start. It connects to the pod within a few seconds and you're good to go. The Stride Apple Watch app will use GPS from your phone if you have that with you or the watch itself if you don't. 
and it will use a built-in optical heart rate or an external strap if set up. Everything else comes from the stride pod itself, including pace and distance. You can't change that. But having used it, I really can't see why you'd want to. I did notice that the recorded GPS track did some strange things when the stride app used my phone for location and couldn't hold onto a GPS signal, going through a tunnel for instance. It doesn't affect pace or distance since that all comes from stride, but it looks odd on Strava and it also results in some hugely inflated calorie estimates. I'm not sure if this is something that stride can fix, but I found using the Apple Watch's GPS more accurate and didn't get any of these issues. Bizarrely, there's no way to force the watch to use its own GPS if you have your phone nearby without turning airplane mode on. I've experimented with this and even turning Bluetooth and Wi-Fi off doesn't sever the connection to the phone, but turning airplane mode on does. As a side note, I use this trick with other apps like the Amazing Work Outdoors, which shows you the GPS reception, and the watch always gets a far more accurate location fix anyway. If you've run with any other running watch before that uses GPS for pace, you'll be impressed with just how quickly the pace reacts. You can move between the run screens by swiping with your finger or using the crown dial, which may be the only option if you wear gloves. The final screen, or the second to last screen if you've enabled the music screen, always shows you your power in relation to your target power if you want to pace yourself purely on power and works rather well. You can change your target power on the fly with a firm press on that power screen. The OLED display of the Apple Watch is very clear and bright, and even a run screen with the maximum seven metrics is readable on the new 44 mm Apple Watch at least. But Apple still don't let you have the screen permanently on, even within a workout, which means the screen only comes on as you raise your wrist and stays on for just five seconds. If you tap the screen and hold your wrist up, it'll stay on for 15 seconds. But I'd recommend changing this to 70 seconds. This can be configured on the watch itself or via the iPhone app from settings, general, wake screen. If you're wearing gloves, tapping the screen may not be an option. But with the latest Apple Watch, the screen wakes very quickly, so in most cases, it's not a major issue. It just makes that glance of your power or pace take a fraction longer. And the screen is so bright and clear that it mostly makes up for the split second the raise to the wake feature takes. By default, pressing the two side buttons pauses and resumes a run, but you can configure this to mark laps instead. It's not ideal, but does work so long as you press the side button before the crown. Otherwise, it'll jump to the watch face and you'll need a double press of the crown to get back. With some practice, I could stop to the second most of the time. You want the strap quite tight so that pressing these two buttons doesn't raise the watch off your wrist, enough to lock the watch if you have wrist detection switched on. To end a workout, to pause if you have the side button set to laps, you press firmly on the screen, where you also have a water lock option if it's raining hard. Again, not very easy with gloves on. You can view previous runs on the watch itself in considerable detail. This is something missing in Apple's workout app and most other apps I've tried, barring Nike's Run Club app. From the summary screen, you can tap on the various metrics to reveal a mini graph of that metric over time. It'd be nice to see a mini map too, like on the NRC app. Stride recommend doing what they call a critical power test, which will create training power zones, very much like FTP or functional threshold power on a bike, if you're familiar with that. The training power zones are similar to heart rate zones and pace, but unlike heart rate, it's not affected by temperature, caffeine or sleep, and there's no lag. And unlike pace, it's one number you can work with, whatever the terrain, whether it's uphill or downhill. Stride provide a few options for the test, or you can use a previous 5K or 10K race time, and it will calculate your zones from that. It's not particularly geared up towards new runners, who are unlikely to have a recent race time and might be cautious about completing the test, which involve various full out efforts. I'd recommend just running with the pod for a while. You'll soon get a feel for how power relates to effort and the resulting pace. You can then try running holding a particular power rather than a particular pace. You can also take a look at the well-written ebook Stride for Juices, or if you want to take things a little bit more seriously, there's a whole book on running with power by Jim Vance. I found running at constant power surprisingly easy, and the final run screen on the Apple Watch, or second to last screen if you have the music screen enabled, provides the best way of doing this without distraction. I set my target power just a little higher than the average from a previous similar run and left the tolerance at the default plus or minus 15 watts. You can set alerts so you don't have to keep looking at your watch, or you could just glance at the display which stays green if you're keeping to your power. It's very useful to see you're running too hard on any uphill gradient or too easy when descending, even slightly. It's a great way of pacing yourself and works really well. Power may not be an absolute measurement yet, but I certainly found stride consistent, which is what matters. I did eventually complete the critical power test, which basically consists of a warm-up followed by a nine-minute all-out effort as evenly paced as possible, followed by 30 minutes of recovery, finishing with a three-minute all-out effort. Stride calculates your critical power based on the average power from your nine-minute and three-minute effort. This critical power should be the maximum power you could maintain for a one-hour run. You can then use this value and the calculated zones for your training or to set a target power for a race. 
Post run, your data automatically syncs to and can be analyzed in Stride's own power center on a smartphone or tablet, but also stride.com. It's a nice tool for analyzing your runs. Clicking on the summary values expands them to reveal further metrics. The graph can include up to 10 metrics and can be zoomed into an area of interest. The map shows your power zones visually as you completed the run and laps or splits are tabulated below. There's also a calendar which displays your RSS or running stress scores for each run, which could be used to check you're not overdoing it. The improved tab is confusing to say the least, but it makes more sense once you have a good few weeks of runs. Most of the analysis features are also available on the mobile app, which is more user friendly, but without the level of detail the web version offers. If you like to share, the mobile app also has a neat storyline feature that produces the flyby of your run, very similar to relive.cc, but with power. You can also configure where your runs get automatically synced under settings. All the main platforms are supported, including Strava and Training Peaks. If you're using a Garmin watch, you should let Garmin do the syncing to other platforms and import the run into PowerCenter from Garmin. I also tried Stride with one of the cheapest compatible running watches, the Garmin 4Runner 230, basically the 235 without optical heart rate. Setup is a little bit more complex than with the Apple Watch. You need to download the Stride Power Connect IQ app, then you need to configure one of the watch's data fields to display Stride Power. Then you add the Stride as a foot pod, taking note of the anti-ID. You need to configure the foot pod to always use as a speed source. And you need to turn auto calibration off. Stride also recommend explicitly inputting the anti-ID noted earlier in the settings of the Connect IQ app under Data Field, Stride Power, Settings. You can also change the power averaging from real time to 3 second, 10 second, 30 second lap average or average power. Unfortunately, you can only have the one power field, so you can't, for example, have real-time power and lap power. Garmin's more expensive multi-sport watches like the 4Runner 935 support a second power field using the third-party App Builder 5 Connect IQ app. With this watch, when GPS is on, you'll only get power and pace from Stride. Distance will come from GPS. If you turn GPS off for indoor use, you'll get power, pace and distance. A lot of the newer Garmin watches let you get pace and distance from Stride even with GPS on. The combination of Stride and a budget watch like the 4Runner 230 is one of the least expensive forays into running power, even more so if you manage to find a watch second hand. Garmin's running power requires one of their high-end watches and their running pod or a compatible heart rate strap, specifically the HRM Run or HRM Try. Currently that will set you back at least £400 or $400 in total. I've mainly focused on using Stride with an Apple Watch, turning what is undoubtedly a great smartwatch, if you happen to have an iPhone, into a fully featured running watch. Still, that option won't suit the ultra marathon runner because of the Apple Watch's battery life and lack of ruggedness for that matter. And many runners would be put off by the lack of buttons and the race to weight limitation. But if you're only running a few hours a week, there's a lot more time when the watch itself is more important. And it is compatible with a plethora of running specific watches if you prefer, and work just fine with the more entry level Garmin 4Runner 230. There is a lot to like about Stride. It's simple to get started, it's lightweight and unobtrusive, the battery life is good, and the wireless charging is a convenient feature. In an immature market, I think it offers one of the most realistic and consistent power measurements currently available, backed by an enthusiastic and helpful support team. The fact that it measures accurate distance and pace without any calibration is a huge selling point, and all the additional running metrics can only help develop your running form if you're willing to spend some time understanding them. The big question is whether you can justify the price which whilst relatively inexpensive compared to bike power meters is still pricey. I think it's worth it if you're willing to spend some time understanding how to get the most out of it. Don't let all the marketing images of elite athletes intimidate you. It's just as useful in my opinion for someone starting out trying to improve and avoid injury. I hope you found the video useful. Please do like and subscribe if you did and take a look at the technologyman.com for the written review, which includes a summary of the pros and cons. Thanks for watching.